Welcome to Zion Fellowship's Bible Wire. In these podcasts, we discuss what the Bible says, line upon line and precept upon precept. Today, Tom Brennan will be continuing our study on the book of 1 John. Settle in for the next few minutes and learn more about who God is and how he loves. Okay, welcome back. We have been going through the epistle of 1 John, the letter of 1 John. And right now we are in uh, chapter 2, moving into the area of 3. But we're going to go back and we're going to backtrack just a moment just to give a little bit of continuity between the last lesson where we were talking about uh, a church split that was going on here in... um, in this congregation that, uh, or congregations that John is addressing right here. And we're talking about Paul and Barnabas, how there was a church split that went on. And I'm bringing this in as an illustration right now. It's not actually talked about in First John specifically, but I'm using it to illustrate how believers need to be careful about when they divide and how they divide. So what happened is Paul and Barnabas had a great contention, and they actually got into this this disagreement over John Mark, who later wrote the Gospel of Mark. And so anyway, Paul and Barnabas, they split asunder one from another, the King James says. And so this tells us that even godly, powerful men can end up dividing from each other. It is not new. This can happen. We can have legitimate differences of opinion. Now, please notice that Paul never goes off and says, Barnabas is a liar and an antichrist. <laughs> and we don't hear of Barnabas calling Paul a liar and an antichrist. They may have had some other, um, you know, less than um, than uh, complimentary things to say, but they do not call them heretics. They don't go there with it. And that's a very important distinction to make. Maturity means we can we can understand if somebody has a different um, different take on something. So here's one of the beautiful things. Paul and Barnabas were reconciled later. You can see this in scripture. In 60 AD, when Paul was in prison in Caesarea, he ended his letter to the church in Colossae near Ephesus. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So he's mentioning him right now, saying, okay, uh, Mark's actually okay now. (laughs) I like Mark. And then he's talking about Barnabas, obviously with no taint. So sometime in the 50s, Paul had reconciled with Mark, perhaps at the prompting of Barnabas. At the end of Paul's life, he's in prison again in Rome, awaiting his beheading. And over 10 years after Paul and Barnabas had a fight over Mark. Paul writes to his own disciple Timothy, only Mark is here, uh, only Luke is here with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful for me in the ministry. Again, here is Paul reconciled to Barnabas and Mark, the person that they fought over. So now Mark is seen as being a, a worthy and reliable you know, solid member and disciple. And so we have this right here. So whatever Barnabas did later, he and Paul did not let this incident destroy the relationship. Later, when Paul was in prison, he speaks of Barnabas. And at another time, um, he counts on Barnabas at the same level as himself, comparing them to apostles in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Do we not have the right to the company of a believing wife like other apostles and the Lord's brothers in Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I lack the right not to work? So, What we have right here is we have Paul has now come to a place where he and Barnabas are reconciled. They're talking. They're back in it. I had been taught years ago that Barnabas was on the outs because he disagreed with with uh, Paul, and it's very clear because it says in the scripture that uh, that um, that the that uh, Paul and Silas were recommended by the brethren. But I I think that's taking things too far. I also think that sometimes people want the scripture to talk about why one is better than another, and that's really not what we get out of of either the scriptures and Paul's relationship with Barnabas or here in 1 John. So now, 1 John, we're moving forward into something. Now, this right here is something of a... um, Uh, kind of a very important part of this teaching because we're going to talk about specific doctrinal warnings against Gnosticism. This is in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verses 20 to 29. So he he starts this right now. We pick up where we left off, and he begins to say that right now, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie 
is of the truth. So John is countering the Gnostics here. Remember, the Gnostics were talking about secret knowledge. The Gnostics were talking about having some kind of a uh, some kind of a, a one-upmanship, so to speak. So John is countering it. He's saying that you guys have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So forget this Gnosticism. You know all things. You don't need the secret knowledge. Here he's being kind of in your face to the Gnostics who claim the secret knowledge. And then he goes on, who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So now he is specifically opposing the Gnostics' core beliefs, and we're going to unpack this in a moment here. Let's go on. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. So he's saying, don't be diverted from the path God has laid out for you. Don't listen to trendy new boutique ideas about Christ. Cling to what you have heard, the ancient past. So it's this appeal to remember what you were taught. Don't let it go. There's going to come people who will have... Um, it will have, you know, very sugary words that, that will tickle yours. He says, don't listen to that. And then he goes on. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So he appeals now to the anointing that they have received. Don't be led away by fancy arguments. Don't listen to these Gnostics saying that they've got this cool new idea. Remember that the power of God led you all to repentance and the wonders you've seen in Jesus' name, his resurrection bodily, what I've told you about Jesus rising from the dead bodily. Because remember, John was there and he saw it. And he's saying, don't listen to these people who said Jesus didn't have a body because that's part of the error. So we're going to do a brief overview of the Gnostics' errors. And so I want to just kind of compare this right now because, um, again, I like these Lord of the Rings references. I think I might have said this before, but we have Gandalf at the Mines of Moria. And he reads this sign over the door and the sign says in Elvish, speak friend and enter. And he thinks he's got it, so he just says something and nothing happens. Another password, nothing happens, goes on and on and on. And so what happens right here is this is actually Gandalf uh, kind of falling into this whole thing that there had to be a secret knowledge. There had to be the secret knowledge. And actually, it was much more basic. It was like the Elvish word was friend melon. And he had to say speak friend and enter and he gets in. So anyway, just kind of throwing that out because I love Lord of the Rings. But we'll move on now to Gnosticism, which was influenced by such philosophers as Plato. And it advocated a dualism, asserting that matter was inherently evil and the spirit was good. As a result of this, these false teachers, although attributing some form of deity to Christ, denied his true humanity to preserve him from evil. It also claimed elevated knowledge, a higher truth known only to those in on the deep things. Only the initiated had the mystical knowledge of truth that was higher even than the scripture. So we're starting to pick up why John was so strong about this. So Gnosticism is um, essentially spirits good and uh, matter is evil. Now, instead of divine revelation standing as the judge here uh, over man's ideas, man's ideas are judging God's revelation. So the heresy featured two basic forms. First, some physical reality of Jesus, um, first, some physical reality of Jesus by reminding his readers that he was an eyewitness to, a, okay, let me, uh, I, something wrong here and what I wrote here. But the first thing what he's saying right here is John is saying, I saw this. I saw this. I know that Jesus was here. So this whole thought, this denial that Jesus had a physical body is just wrong. And so he's completely coming against that right now. And so according to early tradition, Irenaeus, another form of this heresy, which John attacked, was led by a man named Serinthus, who contended that the that, uh, the, that Christ's spirit descended on the human Jesus at his baptism, but left him just before his crucifixion. So John wrote that the Jesus who was baptized at the be beginning of his ministry was the same person who was crucified on the cross. So there's all this tricky kind of, you know, um, picky theology that starts to come out right here. And they're, having, they're giving a Christology, the, the Gnostics were, that just wasn't consistent with the revelation that Jesus truly was 100% God, 100% man, and came and walked on this planet. So these heretical views, they destroy the true humanity of Jesus, but also the atonement for Jesus must not only have been truly God, but also truly human and physically real man who was actually sacrificed and died upon the
the cross in order to be the acceptable substitutionary sacrifice for sin. In Hebrews, we have that whole thought that we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus came, and instead of offering the blood of animals, offered his own blood. And that is what has sanctified us and brought us into the Holy of Holies, which we can enjoy today. Uh, The Gnostic idea that matter was evil and only spirit was good led to this idea that either the body should be treated harshly, a form of asceticism, so essentially like monks who would self-flagellate and freeze themselves and not eat anything and fast, um, or or they would say that sin committed in the body had no connection or effect on one's spirit, and this led some, especially John's opponents, to conclude that sin committed in the physical body did not matter. Matter. Absolute indulgence in immorality was permissible. One could deny sin uh, even existed and disregard God's law. So John emphasized the need for obedience to God's laws, uh, for he defined the true love of God as obedience to his commandments. So now we're seeing why this is kind of tying together and why John is trumpeting this point that he says, you know, the proof of whether we love God or whether we actually are believers or not is going to be shown by loving people. Uh, A lack of love for fellow believers characterizes false teachers, especially as they separated their deceived followers from the fellowship of those who remained faithful to apostolic teaching, leading John to reply that such separation outwardly manifested that those who followed false teachers lacked genuine salvation. So they were leaving, they were trying to pull other believers after them, and John is standing there saying, no, this is wrong, don't follow them. And then John, gently and lovingly, but with unquestionable apostolic authority, sends this letter to the churches to his sphere of influence to stem this spreading plague of false doctrine. So, and then we have at the end here, uh, at the end of this right here in chapter 2, Two, uh, John uh, John goes on here saying, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So a proper belief in Jesus produces obedience to his commands. Obedience is issues in love for God and fellow believers. And when these three, faith, obedience, and love, operate in concert together, they result in happiness, holiness, and assurance. They constitute the evidence, the litmus litmus test of a true Christian. So again, this theme of assurance is appearing, this theme of assurance. So John is going on through here, and he's talking about that when we abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. And that is what we want. We want to be in a place where we're not ashamed of him at his coming. So as these errors come across, as Gnosticism has was presented to them, there's errors today. There's errors that are out there today. People are saying a lot of things. There is, um, you know, I'm not going to name anything in particular right now, but um, there are a lot of things that are getting us away from biblical Christianity and causing there to be a, um, a dilution and actually a substitution of the world's knowledge in place of scriptural knowledge. And that's something the church has to stand against. And that is something that uh, we as believers need to also stand against. So that is all I have for today. And this part right here, we're going to pick up in uh, 1 John 3 next time. This has been great. Thanks so much for being here. And we will uh, continue this next time. So again, thanks for listening. We have reached the end of today's Bible Wire podcast. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like more resources related to this podcast, you can find us online at www.zionfellowship.net. We're also available on social media. Look for Zion Fellowship. Thank you for joining us today on Bible Wire.